open it. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, intraventricular surgery here. And what is that? If you're sitting here talking about endoscopic approaches, you've got a long, thin optical device um, that's directly inserted into a body cavity for the purpose of observation or treatment. Um, this is not new, uh, despite what you might think or people might tell you. I mean, this has been around since pre-World War I, um, uh, and it's a great way to approach uh, pathology in a minimally invasive way. Um, what do we use this to treat? Well, hydrocephalus, um, you know, so too much water in the brain, usually the obstructive uh, variety of this, uh, where we can poke a hole and uh, create a, a pathway for CSF. We can also use this to treat, let's see, we're having, how about that, intraventricular, paraventricular cysts. And then finally, um, in some circumstances where we have very small tumors or limited applications for um, uh, uh, ventriculoscopy for doing this. So basically we can poke, pop, pop and grab. Those are the things that we can do. You do have to have some familiarity with anatomy. And I think as a student, um, understanding uh, really these uh, uh, four basic um, uh, uh, structures is gonna be helpful in terms of understanding what's going on in the operating room. You need to understand the ventricular anatomy, uh, uh, the pathway, the fornix, uh, venous angle is a deep venous structure. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, where the thalamus and basal ganglia sit. Um, you guys have at your disposal phenomenal uh, uh, tools that you can download for free online. This is an, an app that I have on my iPhone that was free uh, that can show you structures like ventricular anatomy. Um, you guys are familiar, I, um, I hope, or you will learn uh, the frontal horn, the body, uh, the trigone, occipital horn, temporal horn of the lateral ventricle, the third ventricle, which is really where the, uh, the bulk of our work with neuroendoscopy is done, cerebral aqueduct, this is where obstructive hydrocephalus usually happens, and then finally, uh, the fourth ventricle and outflow. Um, fornix, um, uh, this is a, a component of the limbic system, major outflow, outflow track for the hippocampus down here. Um, you have to understand a little bit of anatomy here, uh, the columns of the fornix, the body, hippocampal commissures, uh, the crura, um, and where they sit relative to the ventricle. If we're looking down from uh, above the ventricular system, again, frontal horns are here. Um, uh, the fornices sit on the, uh, uh, the medial floor of the lateral ventricles and form the roof um, of the foramen Monroe, which is right here. Um, so if we sit here and we take a look at the deep venous anatomy, a uh, key to understanding uh, where you are within the ventricle uh, is this venous angle, uh, which is formed between the uh, thalamus striate vein and the internal cerebral vein, where the thalamus striate vein curves up through the foramen and forms the roof of the third ventricle. We can see that here, um, uh, and, and this is... Uh, 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 this is, again, you can find this online from Roten. We're going to do a cone down view here of the foramen of Monroe. Uh, you can see the thalamus striate vein curving around through the foramen of Monroe into the roof of the third ventricle. And if we open up the choroidal fissure, we can see the internal cerebral vein here, which is its destination. So thalamus striate vein curving into the internal cerebral vein with a column of fornix here. Uh, cartoon showing uh, all of those structures and putting them in context of where's the thalamus and where's the uh, caudate nucleus. The thalamus striate vein runs in this groove between the two. And now uh, from a standpoint of synthesizing all that anatomy, which you're not gonna be do, you're probably not gonna be able to do in the context of just this talk, but thinking about these structures and overlay, having a framework, understand the lateral ventricle, where the fornix sits relative to this, forming the roof of the foramen of Monroe, uh, where the basal ganglia is sitting, where's the thalamus. All of these structures are important to understand. And as you start to do an overlay, um, uh, I think it's very helpful um, uh, in terms of doing that before you head to the operating room. So in the operating room, we got some equipment that we need to uh, at least have some familiarity with. Frameless navigation, the endoscopes themselves, some of the instruments we use and how we get in. Um, frameless navigation, if, if you're a PGY-1, you haven't seen this before, think about it as brain GPS. That's how you think about this. You take the head, um, it's fixed in position. Um, on that same frame, if you will, okay, there's uh, um, this uh, device that has fiber, uh, uh, that has infrared sensors on it or um, reflectors. Uh, and ultimately, this is just applied trigonometry. We can triangulate um, uh, uh, sort of the position um, uh, of this pointer relative to this array. And if we've preloaded the patient's anatomy and correlated it to where the head is positioned, uh, we can navigate very effectively and accurately in the operating room. 
We have a variety of endoscopes we use, rigid endoscopes and flexible endoscopes. The optics are slightly different for the rigid endoscope. It's a, um, it's a glass rod. Uh, here we got fiber optics for the flexible endoscope. So the picture is usually a little less clear. Um, we cannot do bimanual dissection with endoscopy. We can use channel instruments, but we've got a lot of things that we can do, uh, right? We can grab uh, uh, with grabbers. We can cut with scissors. Um, we can use various types of either bipolar or monopolar cautery. Some institutions that you guys are at may even have uh, endoscopic microdebriders. It's basically like a little Pac-Man that can, you know, grab and uh, um, uh, debride and remove tumors. Very common to use a balloon, or if we poke a hole in something, we can enlarge that using the balloon. And then uh, in terms of getting into the ventricle, we'll show you that in a minute here. Um, uh, if we want to go in and out uh, repetitively through uh, 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 the brain without incurring any additional injury, we can use a peel away introducer. You may see these in the ICU with people placing lines. We use them in the brain as well. Um, how do we get there? How do we position patients? Usually these patients are supine. Um, uh, with an incision that uh, avoids the midline, okay, big vein there, that's bad. Usually at or anterior to uh, the coronal suture, that avoids the motor strip. Um, we can either do that, if you take a look at this patient, they're on a cerebellar head holder, so just a, a little gel piece, basically. Or if we want to navigate, um, uh, we're either using uh, pins, which most folks are going to use, or in some of the smaller kids, we can navigate using uh, EMs, they don't need to be fixed. Um, uh, but the bottom line is the position is relatively um, uh, uh, the same for most people. Keeping the head neutral like that is wonderful uh, because the orientation in terms of the anatomy is good. You can also position patients laterally. That's an option some surgeons may use, particularly if they're doing shunt, um, uh, endoscopic shunt placement. The OR setup is really important. Uh, and as a medical student, where you, you know, where you position yourself in the room, you need to understand some of the stuff that's going to be there because there's a lot of stuff. Okay, there's the navigation setup with a camera at the foot and the, uh, the tower that's visible to the surgeon uh, at the head. We usually have two visible towers, okay, um, the tower that all of the things plug into is going to be at the level of the head, but another uh, accessory monitor will be at the foot. Why? So that uh, both the assistant uh, and the primary surgeon have visual visibility of the screen. Once that endoscope is in, your eyes do not come off that screen. You can really hurt somebody in endoscopy if you're not paying attention. And then usually uh, um, a Mayo stand that's, uh, that's able to, neither, a Mayo stand that, that's holding all the equipment. And how do we proceed? Um, you guys have probably already had talks in terms of putting in a ventricular drain. Um, very similar, Coker's point, again, off the midline anterior to the coronal suture. Oftentimes for endoscopy, we drift a bit further back because we want a trajectory that's tucked towards the uh, 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 um, floor of the third ventricle. However, there are a lot of, so you can see that uh, X marks the spot there, but depending on what we're doing and where we want to be in the ventricle, we may come far forward or even far back to get a long axis view of where we're working within the uh, uh, ventricular system. Uh, the surgery itself, in terms of getting in, ain't sexy, okay? It's making an incision, usually not a linear incision, um, because we like to have the hole away and not directly underneath. You can flap that back. We drill our hole, and that's about as, uh, that's about as sexy as it gets. Now we need to get into the ventricle. We can either do that freehand, um, going perpendicular to the skull and the coronal and the sagittal plane. Usually we'll hit water, or we can do this with navigation. Um, uh, and uh, in terms of how we get in, we can either go straight in uh, with a ventricular catheter and then follow it down with the endoscope or using a peel away introducer like this, where the introducer goes in, it peels away, uh, and now we you can use the endoscope. And once we're in now, that anatomy that I talked about earlier on comes into play. So now we're in the lateral ventricle. We're looking, here's the frame in Monroe. And in terms of the venous anatomy that we talked about, here's the thalamus striate vein heading towards the foramen, it's gonna curve underneath, it's covered by choroid plexus here. And then there's this branch, the septal vein, it's very consistent, um, that helps you to get oriented. Septum pellucidum is here a little bit darker in there. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you liked that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.